Hi, and welcome to Creating Resiliency. We are here today to discuss something that is so very topical for most people now, because most of us are staying home a lot more than usual. And I am actually a bit surprised, I even shocked at times, I went on the internet to look up some um, images and I was stunned to see the state of most people's homes. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so I think it's a very timely topic today to discuss toxicity in our homes. Now, I happen to believe that toxicity spills out from internally. And the external simply mirrors what we're feeling on the inside. So maybe we need to spend more time in the next few weeks talking about internal toxicity and cleaning that up. But today the topic is already external toxicity, which only mirrors what's going on. So let's talk about that one today. And we want to hear your voice. This is very important. So let's start with our Echo Private Eye page first. Taking a closer look always. Um, poignant question, especially going into the new year. So that I get to look at, I've been looking at how I've evolved this year, and now I'm going to look at where I get to let go of toxicity. That is powerful. I actually have cleaned house a little bit with some friendships that didn't feel like they were um, copacetic with my goals and my ethics, and where I was coming from, it felt a little felt a lot of um, negativity. So I'm stepping away. Sometimes that's, that's what you have to do too, is step away to come in again and be whole and complete. Um, yeah, so I'm, lo I'm looking forward to this. I know we're going to be talking about products as well uh, that we can use to clean our physical space. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about how we could, how I and we can clean our mind, our mind, body, and spirit. So I knew you'd be excited about this because you're the product queen. So <laughs> I'm not surprised. So Lisa. Yes. Um, I, like Paige, have gone through uh, a lot of emotional detoxing this year, uh, which I think has been the gift of COVID. And I know that there's a huge impact that families have experienced and jobs and all that. And I understand that. But Emotionally, it's been a gift for me to really have time and, and connect with nature again. Um, so that's been wonderful. And I am looking forward to detoxing my home. I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm good about that. I use natural products, but I know I'm going to learn a lot today. And I'm excited about that because definitely I could use help with laundry. I don't use natural products with my laundry. So I'm open to any ideas and gifts and blessings you're going to pass my way. So thank you. Lovely, Lisa. Thank you. And Vanessa, please. Boy, do I love this topic. Uh, and I, as a psychotherapist, I definitely echo uh, Dory's comment about the toxicity inwards that's spilling out. And I think we need to address from every angle um, levels of toxicity and unhealthy thinking for sure. In terms of in the home, I'm going to be page for a minute and show you this little packet, which contains many, many sheets. You split them in half and you put one into your laundry uh, soap dispenser container thingy. So I can do hundreds of loads with this this little packet, it contains so much. There isn't the water in it, so you're not wasting as much packaging and volume. And it's an all natural product, no harmful chemicals, no toxins, no petrochemicals, which is so harmful to the environment, air, soil, water, animals, uh, or get hurt by the production of it and the waste that flows off. That's one example in terms of laundry. I never use dryer sheets. I usually hang my clothes up to dry anyway. So no chemicals there. We're sleeping in it. We're to, the skin is the largest organ in your body. It absorbs 70% of what you put on it, I think, in under two minutes. So <clears throat> when we're wearing these clothes that both the clothes contain toxic chemicals and then the laundry detergent and dryer sheets and all these other things, we're taking in all these 
carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, all kinds of uh, negative things that our body is having to detoxify and it increases the toxic load on us. So it's really a lot to put on your body and on your system to have to guard against. And instead of putting loving, nurturing energy, we're putting these harsh chemicals that are telling our body, oh my gosh, I have to go into panic mode and fighting off um, all these, these things. So I, I have a lot more things I'd love to add. Cleaning products, baking soda and vinegar. Can't go wrong with that. And if you have a surface like granite, use rubbing alcohol or dish soap. And I'll talk later on about how I make my own dish soap as well. I want to be able to make everything in preparation for the Allura Wellness Vegan Intentional Community, which is going to be at a chateau in France coming to you shortly. I want us to be completely self-sustaining, making our own, growing our own food, of course, and making our own soaps, our own dyes. I dye a lot of my clothes myself, a lot of our own shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, cosmetics, everything you can think of. So this is just a little glimpse of what lies ahead. Okay, okay. So here we are, um, believing that the toxicity in our homes, many people, doesn't even exist. Most people don't even recognize that there's toxicity in their homes. And we're talking about breathing. Here we are uh, having problems with our respiratory systems and huge challenges with that. And I mean, I, I was really astounded when I first came to the United States, the amount of asthma and chronic respiratory illnesses that existed. And I thought, this doesn't make sense to me because this country is so huge. It's vast. And there are a lot of rivers and forests and whatnot. What then I started seeing the products and wait, actually I smelt them first. I remember going into a, a laundromat and I immediately had to leave. Immediately, immediately. So I thought it was just that laundromat. I went to another one. Same thing. And another one. And that's what I did. I've never been subjected to these highly toxic chemicals that are used to actually clean them. I mean, clean the home, clean our laundry, clean our hair, clean our skin, clean our clothes. And people are still using them. And I am just shocked that people are still doing so, which is why I think this show is critically important and that we must address that most of our illnesses, including, I might add, a lot of mental illness comes from chemical imbalances. When your body and your brain cells have been subjected to these very toxic chemicals on such a huge, a huge proportion of it constantly. It's just, it's a constant onslaught because you get it from the food-like substances that we call food. We get it from the air, we get it from the clothes, we get it from the things we clean with, we get it from the things we put on our bodies, we get it from the clothes we wear, we get it from so many sources that it's just a constant barrage, a barrage on the immune system. Well, we don't even have a system. There's no such thing as the immune system. The whole body is actually an immune system, but on our immunity. And it, it totally and completely destroys, in many ways, the microbiome. And without the microbiome, there is no immunity. So I'm really glad we're doing this. And I think this will be first of a lot of things we're doing. But before we go into more of that, I would like to speak about um, what we're going to be doing regarding our pledge this year that we most of us made for zero food waste. We had a zero food waste challenge which we launched and I would like us to address what if we're going to be continuing with it or not. So Paige, why don't you go ahead and say what you have to um, recommend? Well, I, I feel we're just getting started. Um, I feel, you know, let's take this in. It's certainly into January. Start the year outright. Really come up with some um, strategies uh, together and uh, hear from our viewers how they're combating zero waste, you know, how they're bringing forth um you know, some new strategies. I want to say, here's something I got under the tree this year. Um, I'm very excited about because I think it helps with food waste. It's called the bees wrap with no beeswax. It's actually made from tree resin, but you cover this over, you can put your leftovers in, um, you cover it over a bowl, you cut it to size. It's 
really cool. So it's actually called Bees Wrap, but it's not made with beeswax. So love these. They're vegan. It says right on here, vegan. Um, and I think this helps with storing food. I think that's one thing that we have a challenge with here in the United States. Things get lost. Maybe we have, we definitely have an overconsumption issue, you know, that we need more. We have a need more, need more. You know, it's it, we've turned the want more into need more when we don't need more. And we probably, you know, yeah. So I think working from the inside on the want, feeling like I want, 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 and letting that go. And then continuing with the zero waste. I think we can go beyond the food. It's zero waste in our whole lives. Yes. So actually, originally, I had thought in January, February, bringing on the same people who produce the beeswax. But then I, th the more I thought about it, the more I realized, but then that's just adding more problems, more issues in our life and more things. If we bought less, we wouldn't need to save anything and we would need to be covering things up. So maybe I, then I thought that's not the strategy that I want. What I want is to actually have a start reducing our consumption. And so thank you for that page because that goes very well with what I was thinking. And for those who do not wish to do so, we can definitely recommend things like that, you know, because I think there are people who will not be on board with this. And so we need to address people wherever they are at the moment. So thank you for that. So Lisa. I love what Paige talked about overconsumption uh, and which is really at the root of it. And I know that I am guilty of that. Uh, not being able to discern what is a want versus a need. And over time, I really started to ask myself that question before I purchase something. Um, in terms of the zero food challenge, I am a working in progress. I have definitely really started looking more at what I'm eating, you know, what I'm wasting. And, and I, I have been more mindful, which I think has, has definitely lessened my impact. So thank you ladies for that. So to address Lisa, what you just said, that distinguishing between a want and a need, bravo, because that is exactly where we need to start and where we need to be going with this. We only have four basic, actually three basic needs, but some people add a fourth in. So the first and the most basic need is air. We actually do not have life without air. It just doesn't exist. We cannot last for more than three minutes without breathing. So the next one is water. Water is the second most critical thing. I'm going in the order of importance. The third one is sleep. Now, some people I notice have added in relationships, camaraderie, being with other people, but I don't agree. Because ever since I was a teenager, I wanted to be in a, on a hill by myself. And there are many people who go off by themselves and they're reclusive. So I don't believe that we need to have other people in our lives. I think it's something to which we've become accustomed. And it causes, creates a lot of distraction in our life. So we get addicted to it just like everything else. But so for some people, I'll acknowledge that for them, they think it's a need. But we need to distinguish clearly, yes, Lisa, between needs and wants. Everything else except for those three are all wants, just desires. You know, the show presenter, we teach that desires are actually the root of all of our pain. Every desire that we have. Think of every painful situation you've been in and think of the desire that brought you there and took you there. I mean, a lot of people, so many people this week I'm hearing who've now contracted, you know, an illness due to a pandemic. And I thought, no, it's not the pandemic, it's their actions. It's it's the desire to be with other people, desire to do other things, it's desire to for normalization, the desire, desire, desires that lead us there. And it's fine. It's fine to have these experiences in life. We're all here to experience all of life, all of life. There is nothing wrong, in my opinion, in having an illness or a sickness or a disease. It's just another experience of life and we're all here to experience it. Now, some people will say that health is our birthright. Yes, yes, but our health needs to be challenged. In order for us to get healthier, we need to be challenged by bacteria and germs and uh, pathogens. That's how we become stronger. That's how we build ourselves. So illness is actually 
critically important. And it's only in being ill that we begin to appreciate our health and our well-being. And even in the illness, we, it, it slows us down. It stops us. It, it, it gives us a chance to find out who we are and to discover who we are basically as people. And for some of us, it's the only time that we rest is when we're ill. It serves so many purposes in our lives. So I welcome illness very much. And um, I think if we started treating illness more as a resource rather than something from which to run away from, I think we begin to realize that we're here to experience all of life. And instead of focusing only on one part of the experience, which is very, very, um, in my opinion, if we only want to experience one part of it, that's a very scarcity mindfulness. So, But when you want to have abundance in your life, then you open to all the experiences of life, and that includes illness. It's an abundance mentality. So I would like us to think more about this as we um, transition ourselves into higher planes of being, into ways in which we actually become much more at ease and at home with who we are, which is the most perfect, be imperfect beings in a perfect world. And the world itself is perfect. The world is not here to harm us. Nothing about the world can harm us. Any harm has been created by our own desires. I'd like us to start thinking about that and addressing that and focusing on that. And um, I'm going to switch it over to Vanessa um, to complete the first question, which was um, whether or not we need to continue with the zero food waste, and if so, why? Uh, so many thoughts are swirling in my head. And yes, I think we should continue with the zero food waste because especially after the holidays when there is so much consumption. And I think that people are more and more feeling that desire to consume, to fill the emptiness that they're feeling from being out of their usual state and gathering with people and buying things to appease this inner sense of dissatisfaction that it's more critical than ever. I think January is actually a really perfect time when people are making their New Year's resolutions, which seems to still be a thing, even though it should be an everyday thing, but, um, or, you know, just a fo refocusing of what I want to bring in in this arbitrarily defined new year <laughs> that we decide now, it's now, January 1st. And, um, for me, it's always, my birthday is actually next Wednesday, January 6th. So for me, it's always the end of one year, the beginning of the next. And what do I want to do for this new year? Um, so I think that now is a great time to really hone in and focus and keep going with the zero food waste. In terms of if overconsumption, when I was living in Paris, acting and modeling and after college i didn't have a penny to my name i just paying my expensive apartment was taking everything and um i was living alone i actually had a fiance in america but i was alone and i was actually very much at peace just not really knowing anyone yet i had i knew my grandmother and my aunt but i didn't spend I spent as little time with them as i could and uh i was living alone and after dinner, I would just go on these walks through the city and I would see so much splendor and beauty and some parks and greenery and architecture and beautiful things everywhere. And I was just so happy seeing it all. I never felt I wanted anything. I didn't have any money to buy anything anyway, and it didn't bother me in the least bit. I just felt I had so much I had a free museum, I had free art, I had free furniture to gaze at and beautiful things. It was enough to just witness all the human and natural art being done. And then when I uh, moved back to America, I started feeling, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need. I had convinced myself I needed. There were all these things and I felt like, to fill myself up, I need to get all this stuff. And I remember at a certain point reflecting, I didn't feel that way when I was living in Paris. And why is that? Why did I not have this desire to consume that I'm now feeling now that I'm back in America? And once I really honed in on the fact that I'm feeling dissatisfied, I'm not happy here, um, 
I got divorced, moved back to LA and uh, stopped feeling the need to consume as much. And uh, I think that when we really honor ourselves and as Dorit said, embrace the full spectrum of experience and don't say, this is good, this is bad. I want this perfect health, whatever I've defined that to be. I don't want sickness. We get not only into the tyranny of absolutes, which is my new term I, I actually coined in a therapy session with the client last night. Um, the tyranny of absolutes that I only want this and this is what perfect health means. And if I'm sick, then I failed. I haven't done things right. I've let myself down or my body's let me down or my mind has let me down. Whatever it is, it's this notion of either or good or bad that I think is is a an artificial and harmful way of looking at things and as dorit was mentioning it's that whole spectrum embracing all of it all the richness we we can't appreciate one without going through the other and it's all part of the the experience of being on this planet and so i think when we can see that and understand that illness is is part of it too and isn't any kind of failure it's embracing and letting everything in then I think we can feel much more at ease. And we also take those opportunities to rest and to go inwards and have more of that meditative space rather than always going out and doing and doing, accomplishing and pushing and moving forward, which is also what we talked about uh, last week or the week before about that feminine receptive energy, not always the going out and aggressive male energy, but the feminine of going inwards and relaxing and resting and, and letting things sink in. So that kind of reminds me of all that. Final thing I'd say is illness to me is definitely not the same as toxicity. They can overlap, but here I just really want to emphasize that when we fill our home with positive things that are good for us and the environment that that don't harm animals, like when we wash these toxic products or non-organic cotton, the highest pesticide use crop there is, along with toxic chemicals in the wash, that water is going out and harming our sea life. So we, disease and illness is one thing and toxicity is definitely something else that we don't need in our lives. And that I hope that we can do more and more to do natural products that are from nature that is the best cleaner and teacher there is. But toxicity uh, creates illness and excess of it, the body, is overwhelmed and and doesn't know how to, to deal with it anymore because the liver is just completely and totally overly uh, whelmed. So, uh, it, but it's it's interesting that the sickness then comes in from the overuse of toxic toxic things, which is propelled by the toxic thoughts and the toxic feelings. But that's isn't the illness that we we recognize this if we are allowed to rather than just being told to take this take that take a, a medication just to suppress the symptoms and not look at what was behind it. And that is the truth for most people's lives. They're never told, go home, see what paint you're using on your walls. Be aware of all of the EMF, the electromagnetic magnetic, you know, vibrations in your, in your place. How many places do you need to plug up? You know, things like that. Do you live near a telephone pole, which I do, <laughs> it's right outside. The door. Do you, um, are you, constantly with your cell phone. I have found out recently that I have teenage nieces. A lot of teenagers sleep with their cell phones. <laughs> Whoa, talk about inviting toxicity on, on a growing brain, a, a brain that's not fully developed. So yes, toxicity is important to know because it does create disease and it does create illness. And, and that's a great, it's wonderful, but it does because then it gets our attention. It's really interesting how only illness gets our attention. We never seem to really be able to focus unless there's pain. The most, the most focus I've ever seen most people, and in my life I'm talking about it, is when there's pain involved. And that's how I started studying the kidnap hand and started uh, training with Deepak Chopra because I realized that a disorganized mind was the root of all of my pain. And so that was my whole, from then on, my one, my one reason that when life was to organize my mind. To come back to what you were saying, uh, Vanessa, about Paris, actually, I, I've lived in quite a few places and, and visited a lot. And I found that Paris is the most walkable city. 
And yes, walking through Paris, it's really rough to me walking with somebody else because I am just bedazzled by so much stuff and by so much. And I used to walk from the Sixième arrondissement all the way to the Quartier Latin just to have this crudité sandwich. And I remember it was an adventure. I mean, I, I set out for the sandwich, but going there, I totally forgot about it because there was so much. And then walking back, it was one of the highlights of my life. So walking is really important. <laughs> it's one of the ways to combat toxicity in our thoughts, in our minds, in our feelings, and in our bodies as well. So uh, Paige, I saw you run, run off to, I think, bring something back. I'm always bringing something forward, right? I, I, um, so first of all, what I love about each one of us uh, on this panel is that we're all on different, um, uh, we're we're all on different journeys, um, with the same conversation, and we're all in different places in our lives, right? So, I just wanted to say, I think, um, you know, acknowledging that people are at different. I don't want to say levels or whatever, but just on the on the path, right? So I got some trash bags. So people use trash bags. World Centric is an incredible company. I wanted to just kind of show showcase a few products because I think um, the reality is people use plastic trash bags, and so uh, many more than not, right? So what do we do instead that's better for you and better for the environment, and better for the animals overall? And this is compostable. So biodegradable and compostable are the best. Recyclable, uh, pretty much you want to stay away from recyclable. That would be like your least. I mean, throwing things away is the worst. But uh, so I want to say that. And then um, I know I brought this up before, but my bamboo Anything in bamboo, bamboo is very renewable, renewable source that we can get from all over the world. And uh, this happens to be paper tissue, um, but there's also other bamboo th products, toothbrushes. So think about it also when you're brushing your teeth, um, when you're combing your hair, when you're putting anything in your hair, or on your hair, or on your body, you know, our skin is our one of our largest organs, receptors. And when you're brushing your teeth with plastic, some of that plastic is getting into your body. And plastics are made from oil, which a lot of people don't know. And, you know, we talk about reducing fossil fuels. Well, plastics, uh, number one, number one, massive in everything. And, you know, reducing, being mindful and being conscientious of what you put on your body, what you put in your mouth, what you put on your hair, what you put on your skin, I think is so important. So I want everyone to take a look at this. And this seems to be laundry day. <laughs> but she has on her heels. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about, <laughs> I saw that Lisa. We're going to be talking about how to deal with laundry and the toxicity in our laundry and but it's not enough to me just to do look at the toxicity with our laundry we have to look at the toxicity in our clothes as well so we might not like laundry day and we might want to create a system where we can by the way this is the kitchen too uh, we're going to be coming back to the kitchen first but let's go back to the laundry so all these clothes that we're wearing and all these things that we're doing, I am recommending to everyone, there's a book by Dr. Brian Clement, who, by the way, was the guest on my Elegantly Raw show this past Sunday. So just you watch it because he, of all the books he has written, he's written some really amazing ones. To me, Killer Clothes, the book called Killer Clothes, is the most important book that I think he has written and, many, and most people have written. In that book, you learn about what fabrics and chemicals to watch for when selecting clothing. For example, bamboo, that many people think is non-toxic, is not anymore because there are a lot of toxic chemicals being added to bamboo right now, to bamboo products. And he goes into that as well. You'll also learn how to identify deceptive synthetic fabrics, which will surprise you, I think, when you find that's why it's deceptive. You'll also find um, white avoiding clothes labeled anti-shrink, 
any kind of anti, antibacterial, antimicrobial, antistatic, anti odor, anti wrinkle, or anti stain hmm, could be the most toxic things you've ever put on your body. And you'll also learn about the advantages of choosing natural fabrics. And he also gives tips for ecological and health inducing, I call this health inducing cleaning. So it's um, a book again called Killer Clothes. And I think it's important that um, one reads this book because I think it's critical to our health and our healing. So having said that, I'll take this off the screen and we'll now go to Lisa. Yes. Um I, is it wrong that I'm having a desire? I was looking at her boots <laughs> in that pile of clothes, um, which is not the intention of that photo, of course. Um, anyway, I am not sure what. Oh, are we having a, a, a problem with it, with the sound? No, I was wondering what the question was for me. Oh, there's no question. We wanted your comment on oh, what I just said about, about um, the killer clothes and, and killer clothes. So I, I think that's a huge part of our wellness that we don't even, that most of us, I'm going to put myself in this category, don't really think about. My, my boyfriend has been very good about bamboo, wearing bamboo clothing. And now that Dorit brought to my attention that bamboo is not necessarily either a viable option. I think it's definitely something to really take a look at. It's just amazing. Paige talked about, um, you know, the plastic, just there's, when you start thinking about it, it just, there's a lot that we deal with in our bodies. And it's no wonder that we're not healthy. Uh, most of us, we're not at our optimum health and, so it's a lot to think about. Thank you. So I want to make this very clear. It's not that bamboo is inherently toxic. It's not. In fact, the opposite. It's just that there are chemicals being added to it because it's gotten so popular and they want to make it faster and quicker and much more uh, available. Uh, that's the problem. So one, just because one says, says it says bamboo, that doesn't mean anymore that you can just relax and say, oh, I'll get that. It's bamboo. We need to still investigate because unfortunately that also it can be deceptive that's what i'm saying so i want to make that really really clear okay vanessa please yes and also the other thing with bamboo is sometimes the process of extracting the fibers from the bamboo plant can be very harsh chemically there's uh, physical and chemical ways of extracting it and companies that use the chemical way that's putting in a lot of chemicals into the bamboo in addition to what Dory was saying. So years ago I was buying bamboo clothing all the time. And then when I did research, when I was opening Allura wellness to see what kind of things we wanted to stock in the boutique, I realized that about bamboo, there are some companies that do a closed loop process where they keep all their chemicals in then um, like the company booty, they seem to have a closed loop process where the chemicals are safely disposed of and they're not entering your skin and they're not entering the soil or water or air. So it's just, there's a lot of research because chances are the products out there aren't looking out for you. I now buy organic cotton and hemp. That's, uh, I have about four years ago, I pledged to only buy organic cotton and hemp and not to buy other clothes. And um, I'm just little by little donating all my other clothes. Um, so that uh, I get away from that system. I wanted to make a comment about what Lisa initially said when she said, oh, uh, I really like those boots, even though I know that's not the purpose of the, um, the photo. What I wanna say is I'm embracing all reactions and that reaction is just as valid as any other and that joy in art and creativity, I think is a beautiful thing, not for, you, you know, I would just say, that's a real reaction. That's authentic, genuine. I enjoyed hearing that, Lisa. I just wanted to say that um, when we, in, I think sometimes we feel guilty. I'm not saying that you do, but I know I have felt guilty that, oh, my focus is on the wrong thing or I'm being dazzled by something sparkly, which I often am, um, that I'm being less 
profound or less essential. But then I started thinking, I enjoy seeing people and art and nature's creativity. I like seeing these things. It doesn't mean I have to have it necessarily, but I enjoy seeing those examples of creativity. The other thing I was going to say is that, well, two other things. I make my own soap from uh, olive oil and coconut oil and some vegetable glycerin and make it in the crock pot. And I use that for my showers. I can use it on my hair, my body, my hands, my dishes, laundry. Uh, what else do I wash? <laughs> All kinds of things. Um, and I also think people wash too much. They wash their clothes too much and they wash their bodies too much and strip off natural oils. That's a whole other topic. And the other thing I was gonna say is plants, having plants in the home. I am a big believer in having a lot of plants everywhere. I like having the, I think it was, I can't remember Dory who said this on, maybe it was on your Elegantly Raw show, uh, bringing the forest inside in terms of cooking. I think it was Kathy, one of your, your first guests. And I always think of that. I love that image. And I do it with the house as well. I kind of like it to look a little jungly. And plants are such a great way of containing some of the toxic chemicals, even though I try to buy nothing that is not, um, like I don't buy particle board things and I buy a lot of antique stuff so that there's no off gassing and no toxic paints and solvents and all that. But in our building materials, unless we're in a perfect world where we design everything ourselves and can build everything with sustainable materials, chances are you have some formaldehyde, some, some different kinds of glues, different ethers. So spathophyllum, the peace lily, pothos, the, you know, the one I was going to run and get some examples of these plants, but I haven't yet. Um, the, the ones with the heart shaped leaves, you know, that trail and go all over that so beautifully a lot of indoor spaces have. Uh, spider plants. These are examples of some very high powered plants that cleanse your air and remove a lot of those um, gases without harming them. They're, they're beautifully done to be able to do that and they create a much happier environment. And I remember right before going on a trip one time, I was going to have somebody look after my plants for me while I was gone. I took them all out of the bedroom because I have them in every room and I put them in the kitchen, just trying to make it easier for her. So she didn't have to go everywhere and remember all the, because I have more than 40 plants uh, to water them. I felt like I could breathe less well in the bedroom. I felt there was less air. I felt more suffocated in the bedroom with all, all my plants in it, sleeping that night before leaving the next day on my trip. And I thought, wow, those plants really give me a sense of freshness and air, and expansion, openness, space. My bedroom is a large size bedroom and there was no less space in it than any other day. But without those plants, it felt, I felt I was being caged in and felt so much less air for me to breathe. Yes, so the plants are critical, very much so. And I wanted to also go back to what we were talking about before because I want to make a very clear distinction here to anybody listening in to be aware that we have no problem with chemicals. We are all chemical factories and everything is a chemical. Bamboo is a chemical. It's the synthetic chemicals that we're talking about. And I think we need to be very clear when we say this, the actual toxic chemicals, the synthetic ones, the artificial chemicals, that's the problem. We all are chemical factories. Everything in life is a chemical. We are a whole chemistry lab here. So please, we need to be more specific when we speak about chemicals in our food, chemicals in our water. Everything is chemically derived. So we have to be careful. We say toxic chemicals and or synthetic chemicals or artificial chemicals, whatever suits your fancy. But we need to be very clear about that because I think we need to make sure that what we're saying has some backing and some clear um, evidence behind it. And, of course, just to say chemicals just off like that, be very, very clear that whoever is listening or watching, just know that we're talking about the toxic ones. We're not pretending that all chemicals are destructive at all, because then we would be destructive, which we are. <laughs> and it would mean that everything on the planet is destructive, which it is not at all. So just to clarify that. So the, um, I'd like to actually go and... Uh, Go back to the laundry. So at the beginning, um, 
Vanessa had shown uh, the piece, the sheet that she uses. I when I travel, that's the only time I use it. But there's also this, the Echo Nuts, that people can also use. And this is this one actually. Children love to use this to do their laundry with it. So I usually give this as gifts to children for their own laundry. And it's interesting because immediately they'll start doing their own laundry. That's how much fun that they find and it is. And there's there's a wealth of companies now, including Nellie's, which is pretty big, and there's seven generations. There are just so many companies now that there's no reason to do the toxic one anymore. So if you find that your laundry is piling up and you say, oh my gosh, you know what, I don't have time to go and get something on toxic. I'll just use this uh, toxic one, this, you know, with all the artificial chemicals that I've been using all this time. I'll just finish it off. Please know that you're doing tremendous damage because you're also going to breathe it in every time you wear it. And it's, and like, um, I think it was Vanessa who said before that every time you use it, it's on your skin. So now I want to go to the bed. This is really important because we also, when we put our face down, and we put our bodies down in our beds, what happens is that we start to absorb any undue toxicity in those sheets, those pillowcases, the pillows, etc. So this is also something that we need to start looking at and taking care of about our, with our own bodies and our own self. And think about how many times we actually give ourselves permission to purchase sheets and things go there on sale and we love a good we love a sale and uh not thinking about is this going to damage me in any way shape or form and a lot of people are not sleeping well at nights and they don't understand why and very often it is due to the mattress the pillows and all the toxic fumes that are coming out of there or the bedding so think about that another big thing is towels when we have we bathe in ourselves and we're wiping ourselves off be very aware of what it is that you're using to wipe off with what you even to using to wash yourself with it's quite an interesting um, phenomenon and then beds beds are important the kind of bed that you use i'm actually welcoming the the plethora and abundance i see now of platform beds why because the simplicity so you can have beds with non-toxic wood now because it's not that the wood itself was toxic. It's the way the wood was is made and what the toxic materials that are put in it to make it look this way and to support whatever it is that the manufacturer wanted um, to sell. So we've got to start looking, looking at things like this. A lot of people um, leave their beds messy, which is, of course, another problem with which we'll talk about in the future about how everything on the outside represents what's going on on the inside. If there's chaos, then that will happen. But it's with with uh, platform beds, it's really hard to to have a messy bed. <laughs> if you don't have time in the morning or you don't like doing that, you might want to look into a platform bed because those are very very different and it stays clean all the time. And there's now a big two vegan companies that make mattresses. I don't know if you've known of them. One is called Avocado. And oh, I just slipped the second name I forgot now. Um, and it, they make mattresses. And it's very interesting that um, the vegan um, community is now looking into things like this. And they claim that it's also non-toxic fumes and that we um, can easily but we can easily use them knowing that we're not adding to the toxicity of our bodies or of the earth. The problem too is that it's not even that we then say, okay, I have the money to, to redo this and to get a new one. But what do you do with the old one? You know, that's still toxic and where's it going to go? We need to come up with solutions for this. And this is why we need to have these conversations. So is it anybody on the panel have an idea? What do we do with these things when we decide, oh, I don't want this anymore. I need to change this. The queen of solutions, non-toxic solutions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Speaking of mattresses, we did purchase a vegan bed um, mattress last year. We had had the same bed for quite a while, which we thought was a very good you know, way to go about, um, you know, not, not purchasing something new, like they recommend, you know, new shoes, if you're a runner every six months or something, or a new bed every 
I don't know how many years, you know, two, three years or something like that. So um, I can't tell you the name of it, but I do want to say the sheets that we have are by Nadia. Uh, Nadia was Zen Nights. Um, I believe they are bamboo, supposedly sustainable. I believe her. <laughs> um, but a couple things come to mind. Um, I, you're right. There's no way. So everything we purchase from here forward, and you know, I I do want to say it. Once you once you awake, there's no going back. So everything that's happened previous to right now, anybody that's watching this, even myself, this conversation is, you know, having me really look to see um, even deeper, deeper levels of, of consumption. So every purchase that we make is a dollar towards something. Is it towards waste floral? Is it towards sustainability? Is it towards longevity? Are you purchasing something that's a repurchase or, I mean, a repurposed item that's now your new purchase? Um, yeah. And I have a show and tell and I realized, dag nabbit, if this isn't in plastic. So there you go. It's seventh generation. I normally would not care to bleach anything, but my daughter was wanting to bleach something. So I purchased this. It says it's, you know, chlorine free. So you know, again, we're all on a journey and I was going to ask anyone here who knows of a better way to bleach something um, rather than purchasing a product like this. It's been years since I purchased any kind of bleaching, uh, you know, stain remover, so to speak. But gosh darn it. Here so we go. So there's oxygen bleach and you can also use um, for certain things, not for everything. You can also use um, uh, vinegar and also baking soda like um Vanessa said originally, and there, there are many different uh, alternatives on, even on the market now, but in our own home, there are many different ways you can do it. And I find the sun is the best bleach possible. Be careful though, because it really will <laughs> take, take any color out of, out of your clothes. You know, we need to go back, I think, to the old way of hanging our clothes on the clothesline to actually uh, dry the clothes, because that, the, 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 the sun, the, the ultraviolet rays of the sun is so clean and so cleansing. You know, in Israel, we're, we, in the mornings, we take all of our bedding, we put it outside into the sun. And when we come home, oh, the smell is just intoxicating to me. I just want to go into that bed because it smells so clean. And and like Vanessa was saying, we, 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 we actually um, wash too much. But if you put it in the sun, there's... It's the most incredible way of cleaning your stuff. The sun does it. Nature does it. We never used to have to do any of this stuff. We used to go to the river and put things on a stone and wash things, and then we just hang it out into the sun and to dry. And so we need to start probably looking back at bringing some of these ways back. And how we, those people who have homes, who have houses, it's much easier to do that than if you have an apartment. Most apartments would not let you hang things on the balcony, although I've seen people do that anywhere. <laughs> So, Lisa, I was just um, kind of doing a little investigation about mattresses because this was actually something that I was juggling with. My boyfriend and I just moved together into our place. We both have new mattresses and it's like, what do we do? And I certainly didn't want to get rid of the mattress, but I just was thinking a lot about you know, this is something that was new for me when I moved to LA was just seeing these mattresses like on the ground. <laughs> it's just frightened me. I, I, I don't remember seeing that in Seattle um, where I was from originally, but I was just reading that it's a huge problem. Like the waste from mattresses would circle the globe in a year. It's a $1 million uh, industry problem. And the good news is, is there are mattress companies that will, if you, if you do business with them, will take your mattress and repurpose them. And, and if you don't have that kind of circumstance, you can do lots of creative things. You cause 81% of the mattress is actually something that you can re reutilize. So you can make cushions. There's, there's different ideas on it. So I thought I would share what I just researched. Thank you. Vanessa, please. Yes, I just posted the link for the avocado mattresses and I was looking at it because I do want to get a, a, a new mattress. I have had my uh, foam mattress that was just pieces of foam that were cut 
and I've had it for like 20 years and uh, it's, it's time for a new one. And in terms of how to dispose of it, I can't think of any good solutions because recycling really doesn't happen anymore. And uh, what do you do with this product? And as Dorit said, the, the toxic chemicals in it, um, everything is chemical and even some artificial chemicals aren't toxic, but the, um, the toxic ones in these sort of mattresses, what do you do with it? The only thing I can consider is donating it to the houseless or to shelters or places where they, they need beds and they have nothing. It's not the best solution in the world, but how do we make it disappear? We can't uh, with some of these things. So I donate a lot and I use things until they're almost unusable. My partner will laugh at me wearing these socks with these holes and bathrobes that are falling apart. And it's like, it still works for me. Why just throw it away? I'm not in that disposable mindset where I just, uh, oh, the minute there's something wrong with it, throw it away. Um, I often, I just dyed a bunch of things yesterday with some uh, blueberries and, uh, and strawberries. I made this lovely reddish purple mixture and I dyed some things that were looking kind of old and grungy. I dyed it and now I love it. They're lavender and beautiful and they it's a new item. So I just went shopping in my fridge. And um, I'm, I'm next gonna use some um, leaves, some spinach leaves to dye some things green. So there's, uh, when, when I get stains on something, I'll dye it if I can't get it out. Um, lemon, put, putting lemon on something and leaving it in the sun also really bleaches things well. And I love, I air dry everything. I don't have a dryer, so I air dry everything. I don't always do it outside because it will get bird poop right away. The birds just are on everything. So that's that's my one um, issue. I love having things dried by the sun, but that is a problem in, in my backyard. And uh, I was going to say in terms of the plastic, buying containers in plastic, it's not, and I know we've mentioned this before, it's not so much our individual Yes, it's all our responsibility, but it's also putting that pressure on those companies to have different kinds of packaging, like making containers from corn rather than petrochemicals and things like that. Because sometimes there are things that we feel that we need or we des desire and we're going to get it uh, that are in these things. And how do we avoid it? How do we find that product in other ways? And sometimes we can't. And so let's agitate and, and ask for other kinds of packaging. And let's also buy in bulk the largest amount we can. I order beans uh, on the internet, which when you order on the internet, there's the e-waste, the packaging waste, because they'll package it in these crazy ways. But I found this company that doesn't have super crazy packaging and, and is a small company and isn't Amazon, which I also try to avoid. And I buy uh, 10 pounds worth of beans, 10 pounds worth of oat groats. So yes, there's some plastic, which I avoid whenever I can, but it's in this enormous container, which lasts me months and months and months. So it's just, again, an imperfect solution to a systemic problem where we need to really encourage uh, manufacturers to use sustainable materials that aren't harming any of the beings on this planet. Okay, so this is important to acknowledge that you, we cannot stay away totally from plastic, but this is something that I do too. I buy in huge bulks, and so, and it might be BPA free and whatnot, but still it's plastic. And but I do make sure it's a big one, so it will last me for a long time. So I'm not constantly, you know, putting things back into the atmosphere and. Uh, it, and yes, I agree with Vanessa that we need to just ask companies and demand that they give us what we want. And, and if they don't, can we stop buying and let, let them know that that's the reason why. You know, I used to be able to go to, to places with my own bottles and fill them up. But now we cannot do it. I'm told we, and even the farmer's market, they won't allow me. I have my own bags I take to the farmer's market. Even now, they won't allow me to do that anymore. So um, I've gone backwards <laughs> because of that. But I'm looking forward to being able to do that again. So, you know, it's it's not unusual, I think, for me to have not for, to have remembered the name of that mattress company being Avocado. because And I couldn't remember the other two. But uh because I love avocados, that's why it's easy for me to remember that one. But the other one is 
Plush Beds, Natural Bliss. It's a bit long, of a long name, Plush Beds, or you can just uh, think Plush Beds. And the other one, is it has the word nature in it. And so I knew it had nature. I couldn't remember it. It's Naturopedic. It's really easy. In Naturopedic, EOS, Trilux, Vegan Mattress. So we do have choices. And it's so wonderful that companies are responding. The more we ask, is the more we'll get. And that's the purpose of this in creating resilience in our life. It's not When you create res, res, resilience in your own life or you make the effort to do so, what ends up happening is that it becomes true for everyone. All of a sudden, companies respond. And all of a sudden, m most people now have the ability to do that. Most people do not have the ability to buy these expensive vegan mattresses. And believe me, they are expensive because the market isn't big enough for it yet. And most vegans don't even know about it, which is why this program is so important because we bring to people's attention all of these things. And uh, there are four of us here, you know, so at some point you'll get to know most things. And we welcome the audience to share with us their own knowledge and, and their own uh, particular uh, products that they prefer or they like as well. And one of the things that I'd like to see happen here is that for there to be an exchange between us and the viewership. So it's not just us constantly bringing these things out, but that viewers also do it. So there's um, a conversation going on all the time. So last word from each person, please, and starting with Paige. Well, you, I want to circle back to what you said at the very beginning, Dorit, and I think um, when you were talking about illness, and um, it br brought me to think about the what we resist persists. And um, I feel like embracing that uh, we may get we may get some kind of uh, virus of some sort, you know, flu virus, whatever the case. And to instead of resisting it, look to see how we can be on the front end of our health and wellness. So that's what I'm leaving today with um, the conversation of how to up up everything in my life, um, reduce things and to simplify things um, and to get down to a small amount of ingredients in products that I use um, and also to relax in the ideas of health and wellness and, and take that on uh, to combat future viruses. Yes. And, you know, instead of us um, actually being afraid of illness and being so incredibly paranoid, I say welcome it. I know I do. Uh, you know, when I finally do feel sick, I welcome it. It's 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 another experience which I've not had very much of. And I used to be very sickly before I went raw. Quite. I was vegan, but that didn't make any difference. Um, and it's interesting because Brian Clement and I have something in common that we talk about every time we get together. And that the raw vegan community seems to think that they're on the, they're they can never, they'll never die. Nothing will ever happen to them. It's like, why do you just want one experience of life? And why do you think you are above the rest of society just because of a certain way that you eat in your life? It's almost like there are different breed to themselves. And how can we get them to just be okay with being human, you know, and not be raw vegan just because they think it takes them on a different level? It's There are no levels. They're just human experiences in life and I think I would welcome it. I welcome things. I welcome it when it happens. I remember going through tremendous huge pain of physical pain and breathing so deeply just to welcome it in and breathing and breathing and breathing as much as I could to welcome it in. And my my best friend, she came and she was saying, oh my God, Dolly, you've got to take some medication. I said, what for? Then I will miss out on this. You know, and she said, you're in so much pain. And I said, I need to find out what pain is like, and I need to find out how far I can take this. And she said, I can't stay around this. I'm leaving. You're crazy. And now she came to me recently, and she said, you know what? Every time I feel pain, I think of that experience with you, and it's made a huge difference in my life because – Doctors have said to me, you you have, I had a knee, knee surgery. I fell down the stairs and I hurt my knee really badly and I had to have knee surgery. And I re, re, I told the doctor, do not give me any painkillers or anything. And he says, are you out of your mind? Deepak Chopra had told us that he would go to the dentist and not get any kind of injection or anything, any Novocaine or anything 
to dull the pain because he wanted to live it out and he wanted to experience it too. And I love that about him. I got the whole idea of experiencing these things from, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, Thomas Merton. He was a monk. I, I've been very influenced by Thomas Merton. And I was so eager to experience uh, pain at that point that I was seeking it out. <laughs> I was very, I was a teenager. <laughs> Not realizing that in doing so, I was inviting it to come in huge piles to me, which was good, which was about to happen. I didn't realize it. What we we desire, we do receive. We started talking about desires at the beginning and knowing what's the difference between a desire and a need. Um, I think one of my desires in life has always been to experience the full generosity and the full abundance of life and not to reject anything. And I agree with you, Paige. It's the rejection of it that causes the suffering. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh, one of my most uh, beloved teachers, said, pain is necessary. Suffering is optional. It's a rejection of the pain that causes the suffering. It is the thing that has stayed with me for my entire life. Once he said that, I didn't hear anything else he said after that. It gripped me so much, that truth of it. And it is, when I was asked once in an interview, what is the uh, motto for your life? That is it. That is it. So uh, next is Lisa. One last word, please. Mm, I love that um, pain is a part. I can't quite summarize what you said, but how the suffering is optional and pain is just a part of life. And I think that's something that I really had to look at uh because in the past i was i suffered from depression and it was so scary to me that i tried to push away of course um feelings that were dark and i've learned that all that is is just information and gifts and if i look at it differently it, it really allows me to experience life in a in a richer way so um i appreciate everything i learned today about dying close with um, vegetables and fruits and sheets and um, what um, Paige showed and Dorit, your wisdom that you shared. So thank you, ladies. I just continue to learn and grow from each of you. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, richness, the richness of the fabric of life. Thank you. Thank you. Vanessa. I really love the idea that um, when we see the pain or the shame and guilt that we feel about things that we use to torture ourselves, how unnecessary those are, and that we embrace all experiences without seeing them as we did wrong or bad or caught, you know, um, there's something deficient in us. When instead, I love that quote. I just think that that is so essential to understand that it's that resistance of the experience that causes the suffering and that not I, I, the way that I put it in the therapeutic world is that there is no good or bad thought. It's your actions and what you do with them that can be either healthy or unhealthy. But when we welcome in all our thoughts, even ones that we think, oh my gosh, how could I think that that's terrible? We just let it wash over us and just notice them without judging them or rejecting them and just let them be. Um, to me, that's when we can be at peace because we're not telling, we're not sitting there judging ourselves all the time. And so I appreciate everything um, that you've all said today, Paige with paring down and getting rid of the toxic relationships and Lisa embracing what you're going through emotionally and Dorit, the teachings that you have that you've embraced and the idea of pain being necessary and resisting is what causes the suffering and that suffering is uh, not necessary. Um, I think it's just so powerful. And I was writing the quotes down um, in our comment section to share with viewers so that we can remember them and refer back to them. Thank you. Lovely. And with that, we say thanks to all our viewers. Thanks, everybody. Share this information. Bring other people to the conversation, please. It's a conversation we wish to have with you all. Thanks, everyone. And there's Paige with her compost bin reminding us <laughs> to compost. Until next week, same time, same place. Thank you for tuning in.